Local election headquarters. Here's Fred Childers with This Week in Louisiana Politics. Good Sunday morning, everyone. I'm Fred Childers. Thanks for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Politics on your local election headquarters. Well, in historic news this week, Kevin McCarthy is out as Speaker of the House. 216 votes yes to 210 voting no. This was started by Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who forced the initial vote Tuesday on a motion to vacate. Gates wanted to strip the speaker of his role after McCarthy's reliance on Democrats to give the necessary votes to avoid a government shutdown last week. Louisiana Congressman Garrett Graves was a close ally to McCarthy and says this is a major loss for the country. This isn't about fundraising. This is about our country. It's about our children and our grandchildren. We need to stand behind the greatest speaker in modern history that has delivered the best conservative wins for this country. Democratic Congressman Troy Carter releasing a statement saying, quote, this speakership has been dysfunctional since day one. Americans deserve better, and it is our job as elected officials to move our country forward. While this was going on, Senator John Kennedy offered his own message to House members dealing with the unrest. I don't have a lot of advice for my House colleagues other than this. Um, follow your heart but take your brain with you. All right, Republicans will determine who they want to support for the next speaker over the next week, but it could be weeks before the full House agrees on someone, all while they have just about a month to pass a new spending bill or the government could shut down. Louisiana continues to be heavily involved in this situation as Congressman Steve Scalise has entered the race to become the next speaker. Ashley Hamilton brings us the details. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise of Metairie has put in his bid to be the next Speaker of the House. In a two-page letter, he says the goal is to get the Republican agenda back on track. I know we have a lot of work to do. Uh, help us stay focused on getting our job on, get our job done. We're going to have to be. Everyone that knows Steve Scalise knows that he is a hard worker. Being the number two House Republican already, political analyst Jeff Cruer says, he is confident Scalise would be a great leader and bring unity to the House. He is going to attack these issues, I think, and try to bring, you know, some consensus together. He is uh, someone that I think intimately knows the, the problems in the country, can work with people across the aisle. However, others believe it's still too early to crown Scalise the next speaker. We don't know if he will get it. Uh, no one currently uh, will have the 218 votes necessary to secure the position. You have a lot of names. This is, this is completely uncharted territory. And with the threat of a government shutdown next month, analysts are curious to see what the next move will be. They've got to come together and put a, a budget together, got to deal with all these different factions uh, in the Republican Party. Another topic the next speaker may have to tackle is what to do with the motion to vacate that was used to force former Speaker Kevin McCarthy out or this could be a continuous thing. Some legislation may occur whereby a small number of vocal opponents will bring an initiative to oust the leadership. You don't need this political drama. And we'll be watching this process as well. The state's juvenile justice system facing scrutiny and lawmakers say they are trying to figure out the best way to move forward. Juvenile justice leaders met with members of a new task force aimed at finding weak points in the system. Shortcomings have been revealed in the last year when it comes to housing young inmates and being transparent with the public when it comes to escapes. The committee suggested providing kids with behavioral therapy and education. One of the inconsistencies I've found in our system is um, uh, understanding of the tools we use. So just because a youth risks high on a savory, there are things that play into that. It has nothing to do with behavior. Testimony from the committee will help lawmakers structure legislation for the next session. This week, a court ruled most of the state's death row inmates will no longer be eligible for clemency hearings, at least not in their present form. A settlement was made between the East Baton Rouge District Attorney and the Louisiana Board of Pardons and Committee on Parole. Jacqueline Kissick reports. 
and the judge ruled in our favor that their uh, intervention was moot. East Baton Rouge District Attorney Hiller Moore says a settlement has been reached between Louisiana's district attorneys and Louisiana Board of Pardons, a committee on parole. All the parties now are satisfied, so to speak, but I truly expect that the death row inmates through their uh, free legal counsel will continue to uh, file whatever suits that they can file. In August, Governor Edwards sent a letter asking the Louisiana Board of Pardons to consider clemency for 56 death row inmates. Several district attorneys and families of victims were against the governor's move to grant the hearings. We have never uh, said that we disrespect uh, the, the governor. We respect his opinion. Uh, he has an opinion that may be different than ours, but he is the governor. He has a right to have his own opinion. According to D.A. Moore, he decided to file an injunction because he believed the process was moving too quickly. And family said to him it was a gut punch. That was a more difficult phone call because they were, they said, how can this be happening to us when the governor just said that he's against the death penalty and then the pardon board put the matters on the docket. Uh, that was a gut punch to him. Attorney General Jeff Landry asked the courts to pause the clemency hearings. They did, resulting in a legal battle. Moore says he met with the pardon board last week and ironed out a settlement deal. Moore believes this was a win for families seeking justice, but believes the fight isn't over. Given those people who have no voice a voice and we're going to continue to be here, we're not going to go away. That was Jacqueline Kissick reporting. In the latest update from the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, the projected date for that saltwater wedge to reach New Orleans has been pushed back to the end of November. Work is still ongoing in Jefferson Parish to create freshwater pipelines should the salt impact the drinking water there. City leaders say while the pushback is a good thing, cities should not slow down on their long-term pre preparations. The plans to combat the saltwater wedge moving up their river are ongoing in the city. Mayor Cantrell provided an update on how that is going earlier this week. Take a look. Work on the Orleans Parish Pipeline has yet to begin, but New Orleans Mayor LaToya Cantrell says the city is making progress in ensuring they get it right. So make no mistake about it. The city of New Orleans is not behind anybody or anyone. The city of New Orleans is leading in this capacity. Right now, the Sewerage and Water Board is in the process of choosing a contractor to lay down the pipeline that would bring fresh water from about 12 miles upriver in Kenner to the East Bank intakes, which provide 150 million gallons of water per day. Cantrell says accuracy is essential because saltwater intrusion may be a reoccurring threat. Always wanting to make sure that we get the best outcome possible because it's not a matter of if, it's when. And if we can do this, and we will do it, then this is a permanent, could be a permanent solution for us long term. Mitigation efforts will cost hundreds of millions of dollars, but Cantrell says she and the Sewerage and Water Board are ensuring the city will be eligible for federal emergency reimbursement. We have a plan of action regarding the financing. So more to come on that. We're working through it. But I'm just telling you that we're, it's, it's, it's looking good. It feels good. I'm very confident. All right. Well, when you head to the polls to vote, you'll see some constitutional amendments. What do they mean? We'll have an easy to understand explainer straight ahead. Stay with us.